Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Chris Hyams, the CEO of Indeed, and welcome to the next installment of Here to Help. This is our look at how Indeed has been navigating the global impact of COVID-19. Today is August 24th. We're on day 174 of Global Work From Home. And for those of you that know Indeed, you know that our mission is to help people get jobs. And this is what gets us out of bed in the morning. It's what keeps us up at night. We also have five core values, and these are the fundamental ideas that guide us on that mission. They represent what we believe, and they help us make challenging decisions about our product and about our business. Uh, August is Values Month here at Indeed, and we've been using our five episodes throughout the month to explore each one of our core values. Our first core value is that we put job seekers first. Indeed is a marketplace. We connect job seekers and employers, but in every decision we make, we always ask first, what's best for the job seeker. In our last episode, I spoke with Indeed Product VP Terrence Chu about our second core value, pay for performance. Now on the surface, this sounds like a business model, which it is, but it's also a foundational ideal of how we operate. If we're gonna truly put job seekers first, we need to ensure that we're only getting paid when we're delivering value and helping job seekers. And this creates a really powerful alignment between Indeed job seekers and our employer customers. Today, we'll be talking about our third core value, data-driven. This follows from the previous two. If we're really gonna anchor our entire business on pay for performance, we need to be able to measure and continuously improve our performance. But as you'll hear throughout this conversation, the value runs a lot deeper than that. And so for this conversation, I am delighted to be joined today by Julie Scully, Senior Director of Engineering here in Indeed. Julie, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you, Chris, it's great to be here. Great. Let's uh, start where we always start with these conversations with uh, just a quick check in. Tell me, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well. I think I'm, I'm very fortunate. My family all lives close by. Uh, we're all still healthy, able to support each other and uh, getting through this like everybody else. That's great. Well, um, you joined Indeed back in 2009. So you've been here quite a long time and you started out as a software engineer. And over that time, you have had a number of different roles. You've you've grown quite a bit in your career here, uh, but you've also always worked on and with our data to help people get jobs and uh, to help employers make more hires. Can you tell us a little bit about your Indeed experience? Sure. So like you say, I've been here almost 11 years. Um, I think I spent the first about six years working on the job search backend product. And so that is uh, the entire data pipeline from where aggregation is out crawling the jobs on the internet, uh, bringing that job data into our systems. And at that time, it's mostly unstructured. So it's sentences and paragraphs. But for our job seekers, we want to understand as much about each job as we can. So we want to know, you know, does that job list a salary? Uh, what is it full time or a part time job? So what Job Search Backend really focuses on is understanding as much detail as we can about each job and making it easy to search that and serve that to job seekers in real time as, as best we can. So uh, it was a huge change happening over those first six years. We were doubling in size uh, constantly. So it was just a constant uh, keeping up with the data, making sure our systems were reliable and, and getting that those jobs there in front of job seekers. Um, I then had the opportunity to go and work out of our Tokyo office for a year. So this was a, a tremendous opportunity for me to spend that year. My family was able to go with me. So personally, uh, my kids went to school in Japan for a year. Uh, we did a lot of traveling. We took full advantage of our open PTO policy, traveled all over Japan. Um, but as well, professionally, it was a big change in my career because up until that point, I was always, you know, I was leading the teams or managing the teams, but I was also the technical expert. Um, I was deeply involved in, in all the systems that we built. And so moving to Japan and taking on new teams and helping new people uh, really was a transition, I think, in my career in terms of learning how to uh, lead through others, you know, grow and empower technical leaders and help them make good decisions, even when I wasn't necessarily sure I knew exactly the answer. So uh, I think that was a real, a real change in terms of learning new strategies and toolkits for how to lead teams. And then after our year, we came back home to Austin and I wanted to do something different. So I had been on the job search side of the house for a long time. So I came back and joined the employer side. So for about the last three years, I've been managing kind of the suite of teams that today we call our, our SMB area. Great, so um, our focus today is talking about the value of being data driven. And so before we get into some of the details and how that looks day to day here, can you just 
give a little bit of a high level. What is what does being data driven mean to you? So, I mean, I think to me at the core, being data driven is really just about using data to inform our decisions. So we all have our, you know, our experiences in life and our opinions that shape how we see the world. But our products need to work for users all over the world who have entirely different sets of experiences and opinions. And so uh, my opinion really is, is irrelevant. It, what matters is, does it connect with our users and does it solve the problems that they see and they're coming to us to solve? So I feel like it really means, you know, we never know whether something's going to work until we can get it out there in front of those users and test it. Uh, and, and, you know, to me, the, the most core thing it means is always asking at the beginning, how are we going to measure success? How do we know this is a problem? And how are we going to know whether what we're doing to address this problem is actually fixing it for our users? So as we established at the beginning, you've been in Indeed for a long time, uh, about 11 years. What did being data driven look like in the early days at Indeed? Uh, that's that's a great question. I think you know really the the value itself I think wasn't so different in the beginning. So you know understanding that we don't know the answer, uh, looking for how we can measure whether or not we're successful, those things were the same. I think really what was different in the early days was that the organization really looked very different. So we had a smaller number of teams, and each team really owned a lot. So a high level or, or main goal for the whole company. One team probably owned most of the pieces necessary to, to make an impact on that goal. So in the beginning, our goals often revolved around being simple, fast, relevant. Those are uh, words I've heard you say a lot of times uh, over, over the years. And so for me on the job search backend, I think we really focused on fast and relevant. Obviously, we want our job search results to be as relevant as possible to our users. Um, and we focused a lot on fast. I think that's where uh, data really came into play a lot. There's two ways we think about fast. So one was in real time. So when a job seeker is searching for jobs, uh, can we get the most relevant job results to them as fast as possible so that we can really help them continue their searching? And so all of our real time search systems, we measured every piece that, that went into those search results, how long it was taking, and it was constantly working to uh, keep it fast, especially as our data was growing. And as the attributes we wanted to know and understand about jobs also continued to grow, we really focused on that real time speed. Uh, the other aspect of speed is what we would call job freshness. So job freshness was basically for the newest job on the site, how old is it? So we hope to within minutes, if aggregation found a job, be able to get that job in front of a job seeker who might be interested in that job. And so we focused a lot on this data pipeline and trying to keep each step as, as fast as possible. And so that end to end of job freshness was one of our main uh, KPIs or maybe SLOs in the early days. I think uh, Ronnie used to get an email if it was more than two hours old, he would get paged. So certainly we didn't want Ronnie getting emails about our jobs this being is, old. This is Ronnie Kahan, our co-founder and CTO for the company. That's right. That's right. So uh, he was, you know, you certainly didn't want to be waking our co-founder up in the middle of the night uh, because our jobs were, uh, were stale. So that was something that we really focused on a lot uh, from the very beginning. So we've talked in some of the other episodes this month about these values as being uh, really an, an anchor that as the company grows and changes over time, this is something that remains true and that we want to we want to protect and guard and ensure that it remains true. But it also is something that the more we live and breathe it and as the the world evolves, we, we get new ideas about it and we understand it in different ways. How, how is this value? evolved over time as the, the size and scope of, of, of your role in the company has changed? You know, I mentioned at its core, I think data-driven has stayed the same, but where it's had to evolve over time is how to stay relevant as the organization itself has changed. So for example, I mentioned that in the beginning, we had a small number of teams and each team really owned a large surface area of the product. And so that works really well for making sure that if a team tries to pick the most impactful change it can make, it's probably a really meaningful impact for our users. Um, as the organization grew, you don't want teams to just grow and grow and grow and become these large things. So we break them up into smaller teams where each team now owns a narrower slice of the overall puzzle. So I think uh, there was a period of time there where we had gotten to where teams, we had enough teams that were maybe narrowly enough focused that the way we used to set goals was what can this team impact themselves? What's the most uh, impactful change they can try to go after. Well, if you have a whole lot of teams, they may be all pointing in slightly different directions. Uh, when you step back and look at all the great work these teams are doing, we may not be moving those major metrics that we really care about that really show that we're adding value to our users. 
So I think we really had to uh, evolve over time how we can continue to have independent teams setting goals, but make sure that those goals are really aligned so we're all pulling in the same direction. Um, I think one of the main ways that we've accomplished this over the last couple of years is we've moved more to an OKR framework. So OKR stands for Objectives and Key Results. So the objective is that major outcome we're really looking to achieve. And so everyone can align behind that. And then the KRs are how we measure whether we're making progress towards that outcome. And so that allowed our teams to still look, okay, what's the biggest impact I can make towards those KRs and towards that objective? And what that means now is we might have four or five teams that have to come together and really work collaboratively across that set to move those big outcomes we're looking for. So to me, the core value of asking questions, using data to inform our decisions, really has, has been constant throughout my entire time at Indeed. But how we use that to set our goals and actually make sure that we're still meaningfully improving the customer experience on our site has really had to evolve as the company has grown. So let's talk a little bit about how this actually works in practice. Um, so can you talk a little bit about you know what, what type of data uh, do we work with? How do we manage the data? And um, and what do we do when there's a decision we need to make and we don't have the data available we need? Um, yeah, that's a great question. It's a very engineering-centric question as well because we care a lot about the data and infrastructure behind these things. I think, uh, you know, first, if we don't have the data we need, I think the first step is we seek it out. So a very common initial set of work is we're going to start down a new feature area or a new investment for the business is to add the logging that we might need to know if something is, is working. So when we have a, a feature or a problem statement, uh, if we don't have the data we need, we get the data. So we take the time up front to log it and make it available. Um, I think uh, as an engineering organization, we invest really heavily in our data infrastructure and the tools uh, so that we can measure that and, and add more data and have that flexibility to get the data that we think we need to measure an outcome. So in particular, you know, we think the more eyes on the data, the better as well. So that infrastructure really allows anybody to query that data, anybody to try and put data together in, in new and interesting ways and, and look for insights. So you know, the core is get the data if you don't have the data. Um, in terms of what kinds of data we use, I think most the most common example I think people think of when they think of data-driven is a user-facing A-B test where we make some small change to the site and you know, we measure in the test group or not in the test group did you perform the action or, or have more success in the way that we determine it? Um, that is certainly an extremely common aspect of, of data. And that's kind of our quantitative data, something that we can measure objectively from our users. But we also uh, have gotten a lot better, I think, at using qualitative data. So our user research teams do research with customers. They ask questions, understand what works, what doesn't work for them. Our customer success teams are on the phone with customers every day, hearing about the problems and understanding what they do. So we can categorize those calls and understand what are the biggest pain points that our customers are experiencing. So I think the, the main types of data I think that we try to think about is, is not just can we objectively observe users on the site, but what are all the ways that we hear from our customers and how can we make sure that we're taking that into account as well as we're trying to solve their problems? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You, you mentioned um, logging before, and uh, I remember early on in in my career, I was interviewing a, a pretty senior candidate uh, for an engineering leadership role, and he had been responsible for building this very large scale, real time financial trading system. It was super complex, and there was all the stuff going on. And I asked him, I was like, "What well, what was the single most important decision?" that you made in designing the system. And he said, logging. And it was like, at the time, it was a very counterintuitive answer, but it's actually one of the best answers to that question that I've ever heard. Because I, I remember hearing that when I first came to Indeed, that just the, the approach was just log everything because you, can, you might not know at any point in time what are all the things you might wanna measure, but you can never go back in time and get information that you didn't record at that moment. So it sort of starts with, let's just capture everything. That's right. I'll have to say, especially when we would investigate, you know, events, uh, we logged a lot and there wasn't ever an investigation that I participated in where we didn't come up with at least five more things we wish we had known. And then we go in and add that. So it's just it's a continuous uh, example of or continuous improvement, I guess, on, on the logging. It's, it's super critical. So 
One of the criticisms that you hear sometimes um, when you talk about being data driven is people say that, well, if you're just using data to make every single decision, then that's just robotic and there's, you know, there's no judgment or common sense in there. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you think about it? what what does the data actually tell us and, and what role does analysis and interpretation play in this process? It's a great point. I think if, if people think that being data driven means that the numbers make the decisions for you, then, then they're not doing it right. I think you have to be extremely thoughtful about how to interpret and analyze the data. Um, so I just mentioned that every investigation, we find more data we wish we had. So really making sure you're taking a complete, comprehensive picture. Um, and it, you have to balance, you don't want to get into analysis paralysis where you're constantly waiting to collect more and more data to be really sure you're working in the right in the right way. But I think, you know, some of the core things that I think about, you know, first and foremost, you have to make sure you don't just look at the metric you hoped you moved, but you also have to make sure that you didn't unintentionally move other metrics. Uh, in SMB, we, we have a term for our do no harm metrics. So every test, we want to make sure, did the test do what we hoped the test would do, but then also make sure that it did not negatively impact our other key metrics. Um, and it's rare, to be honest, that a test moves one and only one thing and everything else stayed exactly the same. So in almost every case, some things were up and some things were down. And so really uh, taking a step back and, and grounding it in our customers, what are the pain points that they have? And as a whole, do we think that this change is making this experience better for them uh, or making the the uh, the workflow that they're trying to, to get through more successful? I think that's really, really critical. So the numbers and the data is is super important, but you have to have a thoughtful team looking holistically at our product to really inform the decision, not make the decision from those numbers. So when we've talked about our values, one of the, the key aspects of, of them is that they're, they're there to help guide us as we're making difficult decisions. Um, you know, some, in retrospect, it, it's sort of, okay, you could say it seems obvious that we should put job seekers first or that we should use data to make decisions. But these are, these are things that are not always ob obvious. Um, they are. Uh, they often lead to to not easy decisions, and sometimes there are, there are challenges around them. So, can you talk about some of the challenges of being data driven? Sure. I think you know I've I've touched on some of them as as we've talked about the journey and the evolution of them. You know, I think one challenge is uh, the risk of getting to local maximus. So again, if you have a lot of maybe smaller teams or, or teams that are just focusing on what they can move, you might end up with a lot of work that's moving small metrics forward and not quite going after that big new innovative idea that requires a lot of people to come together. Um, so I think that's really critical is, is making sure that you're, again, looking more holistically and, and thinking about the product as a whole. Um, you know, I think another risk is sometimes there are improvements that we need to make that we don't expect to immediately see the value in the data. So uh, I know both JobSeeker and uh, SMB now have this concept of fixing broken experiences. The idea there is that there is some sometimes spit and polish in our app. You know, something's not quite lined up correctly or from one page to the next, it looks like it was designed by different people. And I mean, in truth, it, it was right. But we don't want it to look like that to our customers. And so, you know, I think uh, cleaning up the UI, making the experience feel more polished and more cohesive and consistent probably is not going to immediately change or move a metric. So it's really important that you don't only work on things where you can immediately measure um, exactly what happened. That you, Again, it's part of that balance and part of that uh, comprehensive look at the application. Um, I think you know the, the third main thing I would think of there is similar in, in vain is that uh, some metrics are easier to move than others and uh, or easier to measure than others. They're much more straightforward to know if a user is clicking on a button. Um, but some of the most important things we have to solve are can be very challenging. Um, so an example in SMB right now, we're focused on employer MPS. And so MPS has a lot of challenges. One, it's a very delayed metric. So it can take quite a while sorry, can, to can know. Can you just explain like for anyone that doesn't know, what is NPS? Sure, so uh, MPS is net promoter score. So for all the employers that use our site, uh, or use our product, some period of time later, they'll get an email from us asking, you know, would you recommend this to a, to a friend or a coworker or something? And uh, the promoter are the people who strongly recommend you. And then a detractor is someone who is, you know, strongly doesn't recommend you, basically has had a negative experience. And there's a computation that comes up with an overall score. And so you want more promoters than detractors. And uh, in SMB, that's, that's not really the case. We're, we, we don't have the balance that we'd like to have in that. Um, and so that, that number, by definition, is quite delayed. 
And so it can take some time for us to get a read on it. Um, to be honest, it's also just statistically very challenging to get right. How do we make sure we've got a good sample of people uh, taking it? How do we make sure we get the response rate we need so that we're not sort of biased to some uh, section of our population? So I think with NPS, it's hard to get right, uh, or sorry, it's hard to measure correctly, and it can take a long time to know if we're moving it. But it's critically important that we get better at the people who use our site say, yes, I recommend this. You know, this is a great product. And so uh, one thing with with being data driven, I think that could be a risk is focusing on uh, things that are easy to measure or that are easier to move the metric uh, may mean that you're not actually focusing on maybe the most impactful thing you need to, to move for the business. Yeah, it's. Um... It's interesting that you know you mentioned that both job seeker and employer um, are focused on this, and 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 there's a great um, illustration of this. The the job seeker team has had uh, an OKR around improving the job seeker experience overall, of of course, and so NPS is is one of the measures they look at, and they spent quite a bit of time with this sort of hypotheses. Well, we think that you know, one of the reasons that people might be uh, happy or not as happy with Indeed is because of this. And so they'll they'll work on trying to improve a metric over here or try to increase the number of people who are applying to jobs or increase the number of people who are uh, getting interviews. Um, and, and they did those things and they were able to move those metrics, but NPS would not budge at all. And so then, you know, this thing that you talked about in terms of fixing broken experiences, they just set a whole initiative around what are the the biggest barriers that, that people are reporting and just started fixing those. And that was the first time that they actually saw NPS move. So part of being data driven also really is just that it means that you're using the data to make the ultimate decision of whether or not something worked, but you still have to figure out what is it that you're going to try first? What is the idea? And data, data can help inform that, but it certainly is not making those decisions for you. One thing that, you know, when we were preparing for this conversation, you brought up was that some of our core values, and especially things like putting job seekers first and pay for performance, those are ones where it's very clear that the product teams who are working on those things can can clearly live and breathe and, and spend all of their day thinking about these things. Um, but when it comes to being data driven, it's it's not. We've been talking primarily here about the product and engineering teams, but it's really something that that uh, affects everyone in the company. Can you talk a little bit about how? how we use data to make decisions in other parts of the business. Yeah, I, I mentioned in the first conversation what I love so much about this particular value, uh, like several of them, is that really any person, any team, any function can live this because it's really, it's a mindset, right? It's about always asking, how can I know if this is successful? And how do I know I'm really focused and working in the right, in the right place, in the most impactful place? Um, so I think any team at Indeed, you know, if they take a step back and think, well, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish or what is the outcome I want to see? How am I impacting the business? Is there some way that you can get some data around that? Is there some way you can define a measurement of what success looks like? And then you can work towards that. You know, I think uh, one thing I, I ask always is, how do I know if this is successful? Um, one example, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, several years ago of, a, of an area where we use data to make an improvement that had nothing to do with uh, our product is uh, we used to, you know, long before we had formalized IRGs, uh, the women software engineers, we used to get together monthly for kind of a lunch uh, get together. And, you know, we might review a topic or, or just support each other. And one time we were talking about, you know, how do we get more women software engineers? The the next round of university recruiting was going to be starting a couple months later. And so we kind of wanted to brainstorm were there things that we could do to really, uh, you know, get more women applying, uh, you know, open up that funnel and see if we couldn't help increase the number of, of women software engineers at Indeed. And uh, so we started with some data. So we were able to go and work with TA and understand for the previous year, uh, what had the university recruiting process looked like? So what's really nice about university recruiting is that it's a large population of people that all go through almost exactly the same experience. So it's perfect for sort of statistically sampling data and understanding the, 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 the way the, the people experience that process. And so uh, we pulled the data and we were able to see that at each step of the pipeline. So it mostly, you know, we, we reach out to people at career fairs, we get resumes, uh, then we do a screen, then we invite them on site for a full day of interviews, and then we make an offer and then they accept the offer or decline the offer. And so if we look at that funnel from top to bottom, uh, we had a powered statistically significant result that said that women were not as successful in the process that we had laid out as men were. 
And so this was, of course, uh, something, you know, fixing our own house before we worried about how to get more people attracted to start the process. We felt like we could really uh, dig in more and see if we could understand why was that? Why was it that, you know, women were not experiencing this interview process in the same way and having the same success? And so we did a lot of research. We worked again with our with our TA partners on this, and um, we made a few kind of just small modifications the next year. Our hypothesis was uh, that we wanted to represent more women in the interview process, and we wanted to make sure that it was you know we came across as an as an inclusive workplace, which I believe we are. Right? It wasn't like we were trying to make it look inclusive when it wasn't. Uh, but if we could be really intentional about making sure that we were setting that setting that message and, and context to our applicants. And so we did a few things. We did some unconscious bias training for all of our interviewers to understand maybe how uh, women and men may represent themselves differently in interviews and how to interpret that. Uh, we did, you know, we tried to make sure there were more women on the interview panels. Uh, there were presentations that we gave as a part of the on-site day. We wanted to make sure that every group, not just the women candidates, but every candidate saw women standing up and being leaders and being uh you know, a core part of this organization. And it was really exciting because we got pretty direct results the next year uh, that the first year there was an imbalance and the second year uh, when we were able to put in some of these practices, we saw we saw the top of the funnel rates were the same as, as the bottom of the funnel rates. And one thing I was most proud of there, one of the places where there was the most divergence was actually in, in uh, applic uh, offer acceptance. So, you know, someone who we, we wanted to hire men were accepting the offers at a higher rate than women. And uh, that was the place we saw move the most the next year. So we were really proud of really making sure that we represented the strong women engineers that we had and indeed really made uh, new women joiners feel confident in coming to this organization. So to me, you know, that had nothing to do with our product, but we were able to collect data, you know, get some insights from that data and then test some changes and see how we were able to make a difference. So it seems pretty clear that if you can do this consistently and do it well, that you know hopefully you will make better decisions if those decisions are in, empirical and informed by data. Um, but clearly, there's other benefits besides just the outcomes of decisions. So you've been you've been working this way here for for over a decade. What do you see as some of the the key benefits, really from a from a cultural perspective, um, with this value and practice? Yeah, I mean, I think to your point, I think there's clear benefits to the business in that we do, I think, make better decisions. We spend more of our time focused in the most important areas uh, for the business. So as you always say, if we can measure it, we can improve it. Um, I think culturally, what I really love about this value is that it sort of creates a culture of humility. So uh, you don't you don't know the answer. Uh, most people go into conversations assuming that my opinion isn't the opinion that matters the most. It's what does the data tell us? So I think it really creates a nice um, equality and, and, and sort of a nice opportunity for anyone to have ownership. Um, you know, it's not the highest paid person in the room or the loudest person in the room that makes the decisions, it's the data. And so I really like that aspect. I do think it's, you know, for people who come to Indeed from companies who don't work this way, um, I think it can be jarring because oftentimes maybe at other companies, the way you get something done is you really need to persuade people that you're right. You have lots of meetings and you talk about uh, your idea and you try to get people on board with your idea. And really here, you can talk about it as much as you want, but what people want to see is, well, what's the data? How do you know what, that this is a problem? And what are you going to measure? And what's your first step going to be? And how is that first step going to help us know we're on the right track to solving the problem overall? So I think that it, it creates that nice culture where everyone can have ownership and can participate in the decisions. Um, as well, you know, speaking about humility, we know that about two thirds of our tests fail. And so every test we run is, you know, a group of smart people being, you know, really excited that this is going to be a meaningful test that's going to move our business in the right way. Yet two thirds of the time we're wrong. And so again, I think that mindset of we really don't know until we get that out there in front of our users and measure the results of, of a test or of an outcome. Um, you know, we, we really don't know the answer. And I think that creates a really great culture uh, that, that lets everyone participate. I guess to kind of follow up in, in that vein, you know, we, we've talked a lot about how we're using data to, to make decisions um, in, in, in very specific ways. As a leader, um, how has this informed your approach to, to leadership and, and, you know, what experiences have you had where, where things have surprised you um, as a result of using the data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 
as I've, I've said throughout, I think starting with I don't know, starting with how are we going to measure success, I think that's really a critical aspect of, of being a leader here at Indeed. Um, I, I learned, you know, this early on. So when you say what surprised me um, in the in the beginning of uh, the way our our job search product works is that our index, this job index that we use to search the jobs, is built in Austin, and uh, it gets written to disk. It's it's very large. It's a lot of data, and then we copy it out. So our job search web services that are actually interacting with our customers, we have those around the world so that we can be close to our users. And so we build the index in Austin, and then we need to just copy it out to all these remote data centers. And so back in the early days, when we were really always working on job freshness and what's our slowest, you know, the biggest bottleneck we wanted to work on next, this copy process was uh, the, the next opportunity we saw. It was the slowest point in our, um, in our, in our journey for job freshness. And so the, the copy, it's not, we, we, had, we had measures at each stage. So we knew that the copy was the slow point. Um, the copy itself was made up of several steps. And one of those steps was when we physically copy it from Austin out you know, to Europe or to Hong Kong or to Australia or wherever that data needed to go. And so we're all you know, very smart software engineers. And so of course, copying data on the open internet, which is unreliable and going such great distances, uh, you know, we were just confident that was, the, that was the biggest bottleneck. So we spent about three or four months and we, we devised a system where instead of doing one big copy, we were streaming data throughout the day. Uh, and then we could just build the index in the data centers. So the same amount of work had to happen, but we didn't have this one massive copy uh, to get that data copied out. And uh, so we, we worked on this, we designed it, we implemented it. And uh, I remember we rolled it out and made sure everything was working. And then the next morning we came in, we all sat down to look at the data, right? How did we do? Did we solve this problem? Um, we hadn't made a dent. So, I mean, maybe it had come down a small amount, but it just, it didn't move it at all. And we were just, uh, baffled, I guess. How, you know, how is this possible? So we first checked to make sure everything was working as expected. It was. Um, and so then we thought, well, you know, how is it that this, this didn't solve the problem? So we had to kind of take a step back and go add a lot more logging. Uh, so we talked about logging from the beginning and there's several pieces of the process um, that we didn't know each individual piece. We assumed that this big cross data center copy was the slowest piece. Well, it wasn't. The slowest piece was the one piece we didn't remove, which was in the data center, copying it from the host machine out to all the web service machines that actually serve the results. And as we dug into it, it became, you know, it was, it was clear why once we really understood some of the restrictions that we had in our, in our network. But, um, but it was just so counterintuitive to how we thought about it. And so I feel like that was a lesson. Uh, I think many of us have to learn once, which again, you know, especially when you talk about from an engineer and you're building a system, you know, we'd like to think that we can reason our way through the systems. But even even there with sound judgment, you have to just have the right data and make sure that you're asking the right questions. And so if we had just taken an extra week or two up front to really log each of those pieces, we could have saved ourselves four months worth of effort that didn't actually solve the problem we were trying to solve. So I think for me, that was one of those moments that really cemented, I don't know, I don't know the answer, I need the data and I need to make sure that I use that to kind of inform where I invest. That's great, I love that. Um, I, yeah, I love stories about being wrong. Those are, those are some of my favorite stories. Um, so, you know, we started this series uh, back in April really around um, the outbreak of COVID-19 and, and how Indeed has, has responded to that. And that's an area where, where you know, data um, has helped inform some of our decisions and, and how we've acted as a business as well. Can you, can you talk a little bit about um, what some of the engineering and product teams have been looking at in terms of how our teams have adapted to working in this environment? Sure, you know, there's been a lot of articles in the news about the way companies are looking at how this has affected their their team's culture and, and sort of throughput. You know, we've for about the last maybe one to two years, we've been focusing uh, in the engineering organization on what we call operational efficiency. So really looking holistically at how much are we able to ship products to our users, you know, with what quality are we able to move as fast as we would like? So we had a lot of uh, data that we already were collecting about how many tickets we were creating, uh, how many times we were shipping new code to production, um, how many bugs we found in production. So we had a lot of measures. And you know, I think we, we talked early on about the, the numbers don't make decisions for you. We never look at these things super granularly or look at, you know, compare one team to another team because that's not meaningful. But at the higher level, the trends of how these things progress over time is something that can be really useful. 
So, uh, you know, when, when overnight everyone starts working from home, we did look at this data quite a lot to understand the impact. Um, and we were, to be honest, we were surprised. At first, we saw very little impact. You know, teams still kept chugging along. I think, you know, we saw this in the news media as well. I think that people expected somehow for the, the company to collapse the next day when people started working from home, but really it didn't. People just kept on uh, doing their work. What we did observe was maybe a month, month and a half in, we started to see some declines. And so I think uh, one of the uh, hypotheses for this is that when we first started the work from home, uh, there was a lot already in flight. There was kind of execution uh, was, was happening. And so you can really keep going uh, without needing to change a lot about how you work. <clears throat> but as those projects wrapped up and people rolled onto new projects, that's really when we came across needing new strategies. So how do you collaborate with your stakeholders? You know, a common early step in a, a new feature is for a set of engineers and maybe product and UX to get in the room and whiteboard out how, how they want it to work. Well, we couldn't do that. So I think what we found was as people were really starting to need to develop new things and, and come across parts of their day-to-day -day work that really required that collaboration and that community, they, you know, they kind of had to, they slowed down a little bit as, as teams figured out uh, new ways of working. Um, and so we were a little bit concerned because it, it continued for several weeks, a, a decline there. But after about, you know, a month or so of that, it, it started to come back up. And what we've seen is for the last couple of months, we've really achieved a steady state where we're consistently achieving the same velocity and throughput as we were when we were all in the office together. So, you know, I think uh, before COVID-19, would I have thought that we could basically turn our offices off overnight and except for a dip while people were adapting, really maintain the same velocity. I, I would have never thought that. So it's, it's really been surprising and, and uh, exciting to see. That's great. Well, as, um, as we wrap up here, um, you know, one of the, the things that I, I like to hear from folks is, is obviously what's been going on for the last several months has been, you know, an, an extraordinary challenge for, for the world and for our employees and, and our customers and, and for job seekers. Uh, and there's a lot that we all hope goes back to some kind of normal at some point soon. But um, there also have been things like our ability to, you know, maybe work remotely that, that we've seen um, that have been, you know, the, the, the silver linings. And, and so I guess what, what for you on a personal level um, have you seen that has given you some optimism for the, for the months and years ahead? I think the main thing there really is just the the ability for people to adapt to such change. And, and you know, it's hard and it's stressful on all of us and, and it's not like it's easy, but uh, people are making it work. So my kids, uh, we started school last week. My kids are on day three of virtual learning. And every morning they get up and they put on their headphones and, and they're learning and they raise their hand for their teacher and they're running around uh, playing scavenger hunt games and, and trying to engage with their classmates. And so I think it's really... Um, you know, five months ago, was there any thought that we would be doing, you know, schooling from home uh, where, you know, the families are in a room together all on Zoom meetings? I think it's it's uh, I hope it's not this way forever. But uh, I think the, the the speed with which people have adapted and the flexibility we've shown as a, as a society in those things, I think, has been really amazing. Um, I think on a more personal level, you know, a few a few weeks maybe after the initial kind of shutdowns happened, obviously everyone's in their homes and getting out and taking walks is is the way you could get out of the house, right? And you could stay safely away from from people. And there's a trail in my neighborhood that uh, is is very common walking path. And I remember, you know, a few weeks in, one night we were walking and my kids started noticing these rocks, and so they were painted rocks along the trail that, of course, hadn't been there before, and they had butterflies. It was clearly some children had done some of them, but some of them I think were done by adults. Um, some of them had words on them. They would say hope or love. And over the, the days, it just grew and grew. And I'm sure to this day, I don't know who, who started it. I'm sure lots of people are doing it now. But in our neighborhood, there are just these painted rocks that are everywhere. And uh, it extended to mailboxes. So every house in the neighborhood where I live has a mailbox at the street in front of the house. And every mailbox has a rock on it and it changes every couple of days. And it just has a saying or something inspiring on it. Um, this morning, uh, mine said nice yard, which I, I had to laugh because everything's dead. It's been 100 degrees for the last three weeks here in Texas. So I, I, I hope it was a joke. <laughs> maybe maybe my yard's doing better than other people's. But again, I think, you know, on the on the national level, there's so much that divides us and there's so much we need to improve as a society. But I think if you look at 
your communities, the neighborhoods around you, the schools, you know, your teams at work. I think people have really pulled together and adapted. I think that uh, that really has, I've, I found it really inspiring. Well, that's really beautiful. Um, thank you for sharing that. And, and thanks for joining me today for this discussion. Um, it's been it's been really great to to talk to you and, and to get to know you over the last ten years and to see you grow in in your career here career here at Indeed, but um, also just to see how much you've helped really shape the the culture here over time. So thank you for everything you do for Indeed and to help people find jobs all over the world. Yeah, and, and same to you. And it's it really has uh, just been an amazing last uh, eleven years. I've gotten so many opportunities. It's been really terrific for me as well. So thank you for having me. Great. Well, thanks. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you all next week.